To pass or to play, that is the theme of today's video. And we started a little bit into this game <laughs> because I forgot to start recording, but it ended up being a pretty good one. <clears throat> so I'm playing up against some kind of variant of, it's almost like a kind of like mid, if mid-range exists in Gwent, this would be kind of like a mid-range Breaver Hoog Skoa Tal deck. So we start off with a pretty good point. I've actually probably already discussed this already, but if someone is playing a spy against you and you have a spy, it's usually pretty good to just go ahead and play your own spy in return. And being able to draw into a very powerful gold is just a bit of a cherry on top. The reason you do that is because I want to extend this round out. I want to be able to win this round. And also he um, he went second. Yes, he went second. So I definitely want to try and elongate this round and, take, and continue to stay in control of it. Additionally, you're in a really precarious position if you try to pass when they play a spy. Because then you start to overplay, and that's never good. <clears throat> so just playing a spy allows us both to say, you know what, we're just going to both draw a card and then go to the next action. So I can retain my advantage while also not putting myself in a bad situation. A possible bad situation. And I follow up here, I'm probably just going to speed through a lot of this, because this is pretty standard... John Cove 8 Spies play. Nothing too interesting here. I'm just like I've said in a also in a previous video, <laughs> like most of what I'm gonna say. Uh, I'm just setting up my combo pieces like my Enforcer and my Imperial Brigade. Brigade you don't necessarily need to play early, but it can be nice to have <clears throat> a nice steady tempo option that's constantly ticking. He does shut it down, but that's totally okay. Uh, I play my second brigade because I have four spies already out on the board and I can catch up in his tempo. And remember, since I'm going second, I don't have to pass him. He has to pass me. So I'm perfectly fine by being by playing a relatively low tempo option, even though it's 14 strength. But I'm perfectly fine being under his tempo because I can just if he passes, I just play one card and pass him. That's why going second again and again and again is so, so important because of things like that. And I think I'm pretty sure just as a standing back uh taking a step back from this game he was i think he was trying to bait me into passing uh based on a marigold tailstorm but i don't think he actually had it <laughs> he was just he was maneuvering my units in such a way by moving it to the back row as you can see instead of buffing his own unit because he wanted to try and get me to pass on the idea that he might use marigold tailstorm and then completely sweep the game uh by like you know 30 points or something like crazy like that it's interesting. I always like kind of like recommend like doing those kind of bluffs, but it's really rare to or I feel it's rare to be on the receiving end of a bluff like that. Because it's like one, you kind of like you take it into consideration and then they actually do it or you take it into consideration and they either do it or they don't do it. Or a second, you don't take it into consideration. And then three, you do take it into consideration, but then you forget. <laughs> so there's a lot of uh, situations there in which it doesn't actually you know, manifest itself. He actually ends up using a smite, which I think is kind of interesting. It actually makes a lot of sense since he's playing with a, a spy. Oh, so one thing uh, you don't get to see in this video, but at the very beginning, he played out a... Uh, what's this character called? I don't know. The archer that would do five damage. I called his bluff because he was trying to threaten a quick pass with a high tempo swing by using, you know, all of his albums or whatever they're called. I uh, called his bluff and then the next turn he played this, this, I think it's called like, I don't know what it's called, but then he played this and he continued to try and bluff that, uh, <laughs> I'm so bad with names. He tried to bluff the card that buffs all the units on the same row, but I called it again and we continued to play the round up to where, uh, up until where you saw we started. I think that was pretty interesting because this guy is all about like bluffing. It's really, really interesting. And I think it's such a difficult like gameplay style to go for. But like I get a feeling that he's really good at it. And he probably has a lot of fun doing it as well because he's not playing a meta deck. He's playing the players instead of playing the decks, which I think is really cool. And something that I try to do myself, which is why I try to stick to decks like like more flexible kind of macro -y decks like John Covey Spies and like Dagon Consume. All right, so this is the whole point of the video. Let me change this real quick. Okay, so in this situation, what are you thinking you should do? So keep in mind, I'm it's my turn. 
I have all these cards. I have 10 cards left in the deck and you kind of get a feel for what I'm, uh, I'm, you know, I'm looking at here. So obviously I'm take I'm hemorrhaging six points a turn and I'm under his point total by, uh, by four points. Now, uh, one option could have been if I was above his point total by seven or by six to seven points or six, seven plus points, then I probably would have passed because he wouldn't, ha he would have had to play at least one more card just to pass me, even with Ragnarok down. But he manipulated in such a way that that's not the case. I'm just under his point total. So if I do want to continue playing out this round, I'm going to be at a constant disadvantage. It's going to be very difficult for me to come back from this point. So that leaves me with exactly one option. Uh, 1.25 of an option. The 0.25 is trying to use uh, my leader ability and draw into something big. But that's pretty relatively unlikely, especially in this deck. Obviously, I can't play these other two cards because they're not going to give me enough tempo to get to where I need to go. Alternatively, an Imperial Brigade, if I played that down, that could have been big. That's probably like the John Calvate play you could po possibly go into. But otherwise, if I want a, a sure option, a sure path to take on this turn, this very moment, what am I going to do? I'm going second. It's three cards to four. I'm down a little bit of points. And there's a Ragnar on the field. So I pass. One is pass. Pass is the safe option. You go into round two, you're one card down, you lost it, that's perfectly fine. You were able to thin out your deck with things like Roach, and you got rid of your Spy, you used your two Impaired Brigades on a pretty big board. You're looking pretty good, even if you do lose the round, and there's still a lot of tempo left with Rain Farn, right? And John Cove 8. So you're looking pretty good if you do pass. Passing is safe here. You can totally do that. It's fine. But option number two... Option number two is aggressive, and it says, I want to win this round. I want to control rounds uh, two and three. And that is exactly Rainfarn. Rainfarn is going to pull into Joachim, and Joachim is going to pull into something big, because the rest of my cards that left my deck are going to be good options. If it's uh, a Nodded Brigade, I deal seven damage. If it's an Impaired Brigade, I get all these uh, Spice Energy. If it's something as little as an enforcer, it's still okay. It's probably the weakest option. And then like option four, because I'm not pulling into a spy or anything like that. Oh, you probably can't even pull into a spy. I'm not going to pull into a roach. If I do pull, pull into an infiltrator, which I actually am not, never mind. And then like option five is what's going to happen. So I have one option again is to pass and a say passing is a safe choice. You can totally go for that. Option two uh, the option number two that you're not going to take is to try and play out with moderate to low tempo in these other plays because that's always you're always going to be hemorrhaging more points and you're just going to be wasting your cards and your time. And then option three, which is the aggressive kind of more skilled, I would say, action is to play Rain Farm and go for this super high tempo play. Go into Joaquim. If I if I was not sure I was going to play into Joaquim, I would not have done that. Or if I was afraid of pulling into something like Roach, which wouldn't even be applicable, or something low, otherwise low, I would not have done that. But because I know I'm going into Joachim, I'm going to a thinned deck, I pull into Azir, which is not only the 10 she already comes with, which is a pretty good high tempo play, but it also comes with the 10 from Joachim. Now granted, playing Azir here in round one is weak, but it's totally fine if it means I'm going to win the round. And also, uh, Azir kind of gets diminishing returns based on how many cards you have left anyway. Or how many combo pieces you have. She usually pulls back like Roach and then maybe I usually kind of mess around with the opponent's graveyard. So I passed my turn. I am up by five plus eight, 18 points, 18 points, which means and I lose six, which is 12. So he needs to play. A, he needs to play something and I'll give him 12 points or else he is going to go two cards down. <laughs> so I was, you know, it's kind of like a simple, pretty straightforward play, but I was pretty proud of it because I, you don't often get like to experience like this kind of, so you didn't have a 12 point play, which is rel which is pretty, doesn't surprise me at all, really, considering the cards he has been playing, his, car his cards really rely on, <laughs> it's funny, like how much, uh, like the deck, like the way he's playing in the deck he's playing is they like match up with each other so well. He's playing this very like subterfuge kind of tricky deck and 
in this situation, he just doesn't have the raw power to overcome what I have. And he already used his smite earlier. And as we've already seen, because he used the, the smite or the scorch, whatever it is, he does not have a Marigold's Hailstorm to hit my back row with. So all that leaves for him to do is pass or go down two cards. And of course, and if he did play something, uh, if you played something 12 or under, I 100% would have passed. Uh, letting him go two cards down and win the round, especially with such a few cards left in the uh, in the game, it definitely would have spelled a win for me, especially with my leader ability still up. Uh, option two, he passes me. I totally pass. Uh, or that's 100% pass. And then, or yeah, it's 100% pass because I'm just going to be hemorrhaging six, six points a game. A turn, rather. And if he did pass that 12 strength to try and get over the, the hump that I set, then I still, that's even, that's like 120% pass because I'm 100%. He passed me. I don't want to waste cards and I'm hemorrhaging points. So that's how that goes. Ooh, man. <laughs> Not often that I get such like a, like a, you know, shining example of a topic to, to look at. I was relatively lucky that I pulled into Azir there instead of something else, but until, uh, instead of Impair Enforcer, because that two points could have made all the difference. Or uh, infiltrator, that one point, uh, one point could have made all the difference as well. Maybe even v Vico Bar medic would have been bad. I actually didn't even consider Vico Bar medic. Medic, they actually could have been really bad, <laughs> but it's all good. So going to round two, of course, I just go ahead and pass. I have a lot of my combo pieces in my hand that I can set up over time, and I just you know I get the one card advantage, and he goes first in round three. I, I potentially, this is something I always bring up when playing this deck in this kind of situation. I potentially could bleed him out, but I don't feel like it's worth it. Especially considering his deck is, it's it's his is also kind of combo reliant, but it also I think relies on him being in control a bit. Like, see, he has he has all these cards that kind of lead to, <clears throat> like, setting up a big, like, boom or, <laughs> or whatever. And there's the twelve damage he was looking for, or twelve strength rather. Uh, twelve strength might have actually tied us and go into the round. Three with him one card down. I didn't even consider that. So I guess maybe he did have exactly 12. Or something like that. But he didn't have 13. Which makes sense. Yeah see I guess I could have bleed, I could have bled him out a little bit. Like forcing to play out some of these cards like. Hawker or support or whatever it is. But I'm not too worried about it because I do have such a strong combo left in my hand. And I guess this is also kind of interesting. I actually kind of forgot about this. Uh, so I play out my infiltrator. I know I'm going to put it on Hawker support because I'm going to play all my units out eventually. Uh, so there's there's ver there's like literally nothing else that I want to play this on considering it's going to be buffed up to at least 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 12. 12-ish. 12 and then I'm going to kill with Meno at the, at the very end. <clears throat> he plays this. Uh, this, this would be a trap for your your infiltrator into meno because this is in total not going to get much value it may get something like 9 11 <laughs> i mean sorry it may get 11 of value unintentional 2001 that may get 11 of value but this is probably going to be more like like in an optimal situation this would get like 11. Play the Vigil Fort. It's not that good, but I did want to play a Vigil Fort anyway because it's my only opportunity. Then play out the Empire Brigade. And my general like setting up on this combo is not necessarily to take advantage of all of my combo pieces, but to also. Um, Or no wait, I do want. I want to avoid getting any damage on the Hawker support because I'm going to kill it anyway. That's why I didn't play Enforcer Brigade earlier. But it doesn't really matter all that much. It's not going to get too much value. So seeing this, uh, this Idris, I'm a little bit scared because it's a pretty strong card. And again, this would have been an excellent opportunity to bleed him out in round two. Uh, if I had known that he was going to play Iris, I actually wasn't expecting that at all. What is this? No, I don't want to update. <laughs> I 
Okay. Yeah, if I had known, like, he was playing an Iris or something like that, if I had known, like, the archetype, I was, if I had utilized my knowledge to recognize the archetype that he was playing, and knowing that he would have played Iris, I would have bled out round two, but not knowing that, I was fine going to round three. I think that's the idea. So if I knew, like, for let me simplify that. If he was playing in that deck, and I knew he had an Iris in that deck, and I knew he, like, one of his win conditions was setting that off, I would have played out round two to try and pull that out. But seeing as how I didn't know that, I had to just go into round three without really expecting it. And it's potentially game losing for him. Like, this is a cool thing about playing a non meta deck like that, because you can pull out unexpected cards like Iris and kind of just completely surprise your opponent and force them to play to a game that they're, they're not familiar with. And just as a note, I pulled out Vico Var Medic because I wanted to heal Iris a little bit. Unfortunately, uh, him playing. <laughs> This, uh, whenever it gets moved to deal two damage, it actually probably saved uh, saved him. Or it probably allowed him to activate it. In that situation, then maybe playing out, uh, using the Alpha Trader on it, and then killing it with Menno is probably maybe even better, but I don't know. Like, it comes down to, like, a minuscule amount of points, and, like, in, in, in a uh, C... Excuse me, in a C of information, a uh, C of misinformation, or a lack of information. Looking back, I still would have done the same thing, I think. Because, like, expecting him to, like, somehow... Like, expecting him to have as many movement options as he does, considering how much he used in rounds one, two, uh, rounds one and two, is still really surprising, I think. And he'll just barely kill Iris. But because I have card advantage... Uh, and because I set this up and I didn't, I did not kill it earlier. I can go ahead and kill it now. And also it's totally possible. We still had another way of killing Iris that wasn't using this moment, this movement, uh, damage card. So I, I'm, st I still, even like looking back at seeing how this played out, I still would say playing it on the heart of boards better. Considering the, the predicament I was in at the very start of round three. So because it got buffed and I didn't kill it earlier, I can take it away. Actually, that would have been more impactful if it hit that unit instead of another unit that didn't get hit. But it's it's kind of it plays to the same kind of idea. And I still had one more card to do five points, which is you know really close. I only won by seven points, even though I had such a lead going to round three. Whew, that was quite the that was quite the vote review there. Even though we started in late, this one still went to. 20 minutes. That was a that was a pretty dense game of information. Wild bees, man. Or wild best. He's only level 43, but he's pretty damn good. He has a really cool deck too. That's awesome. That's that is exactly why I play casual, because you get to run into decks like that and like play styles like that. It's really good. It's really fun. Like these are the kind of games I look for when I'm playing Gwent. Not just playing up against ranked, like, you know, at the top. And then playing up against the same, you know, three or four decks. That's boring as hell. Anyway, that's my own little mini rant. Thanks for watching.